Hello and welcome to Betting People. Now, we have a very special guest this week. I'm sure that you can actually see him, hopefully. Um, but it is Racing Host's legendary golf tipster, Steve Palmer. Steve, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? Uh, good, thanks, William. Yeah, very strange times. Um, I think we're all struggling a little bit with the lockdown. So, uh, yeah, I was pleased to... Um... Uh, devote an hour to the shed because I haven't been in the work shed much at the moment. I'm furloughed, as you well know, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fortnight uh, uh, looking after the children. I, any little break I get is, is welcome at the moment. Indeed, well, everybody's in the same boat. In, in fact, actually, what are you doing um, to basically pass the time uh, when it's not you or the kids or whatever? Yeah, I'm a full-time childcare. I'm uh, supporting a key worker because my wife uh, works for the NHS, so they want her at the hospital as much as possible. So, yeah, seven days a week, I'm I'm, I'm looking after children. Not much time for for anything else. Um, but fortunately, all our family are corona-free at the moment. I mean, I've, obviously, my heart goes out to the people that are, are, are suffering with the infection themselves or their family have got it. I mean, yeah, you know, got to be grateful for. Um, you know, just uh, being healthy at the moment. Um, yeah, my biggest concern at the moment is my hair might turn into a Marge Simpson star because it just keeps going up. I don't know how your hair works, but my hair goes up rather than down when it gets long. So, uh, yeah, that's my biggest concern apart from catching corona is that my hair might turn into Marge Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's hope for that not to happen. Um, and let's move to uh, the betting, just what people will want to hear about. Um, so, you know, your betting career is, the stuff of legend but um how did it all start for you how did you actually get into punting it started uh, with an obsession with sport i mean my childhood was quite uh, uh, square in many regards and i was just totally devoted to sport i didn't have any other hobbies that i was interested in uh football cricket lat- latterly golf um so i was just um i used to spend all my time watching sport uh, and playing sport and then as I got to the age of 18 just a few days after my 18th birthday again very square tendency to abide the law uh, I didn't uh, <laughs> I didn't have my first bet until I was 18 and then I was all excited about using this sporting knowledge that I'd gathered uh, to try and win some money and um, yeah the first trip to the betting shop um, I'll never forget it because it, it, it went so well and I often wonder whether had it gone badly that whether um my life and career would have gone on a different path but uh, yeah my first trip to the betting shop as an 18 year old um i walked in and a very very friendly face met me there he looked to me like neil morrissey you know the chap um and a member behaving badly very successful actor um he he was so welcome in this betting shop manager i don't i don't know him i wonder what he's up to now but um and i went out to the counter and he was very patient with me he realized i was a young kid who didn't have a lot of money uh, to play with and uh, the first thing I asked him, uh, I said, I want to back Michael Atherton uh, to top score uh, f- uh, in, in the test match that week. Uh, but it was already a close of play uh, uh, after day two. Um, so obviously that market had closed. I was a, a novice. I didn't understand that that market was unavailable anymore. He said, you can't bet on that. There's no betting on that. So I said, OK, what about the uh, uh, the tennis? Wimbledon was going on. It was the semi-final stage. I said, I want to back Richard Krychek to win Wimbledon. And uh, old Neil Morrissey there, he said... Um, he sort of shook his head like that because he realised, um, you yeah, that bet was available, but he realised I didn't have enough money for an even money shot. Crochet was even money, so he just goes, no, nah, you, you can't have that, it's even money. And um, again, I just took it as red. I said, OK, OK, OK. He was right, I didn't have enough money for, for that sort of for that sort of um, odds. Uh, so then I said, oh, I'll try again. And, um, the boxing, the boxing, the boxing. Steve Collins was uh, uh, fighting Nigel Benn on the Saturday night, so I said, uh, I think Steve Collins is going to beat Nigel Benk, and I bet on that. And he goes, oh, no, 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 that's uh, that's too short as well. That was a sort of even money chance. Uh, so he goes, why don't you pick a round? Why don't you pick a round that he can, he can win in? Uh, and I said, oh, OK, OK. And um, I went um, sort of Dragon's Den style, walked to the wall in the betting shop, had a little think about it, um, spent about 30 seconds mulling it over, and I came back and said, OK, round four, Collins in round four. And he said, uh, yeah, he had a little fill on his computer and said 40 to one. I gave him two pounds out of this bum bag that I had around me, William. I was a very stylish youngster. <laughs> I was wearing a bum bag because I'd just been to the uh, um, a car boot sale. I just finished a car boot sale at the, at the back of the uh, the Ford Fiesta. And um, I gave him two pounds. So it was two pounds at 40 to one Collins to win in round four. And then um, and then I went home uh, on, on the Saturday night and uh, and watched the fight. And it was, um, yeah, it was incredible. Do you remember that one? You're too young for that one, aren't you? 
<laughs> you're you're belying my age. Uh, I might be a, a bit too young for it. A refresher for our younger viewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a it was a bit of a washout because it was billed as a, a great fight, and Collins was on top in the early rounds. But then, come round four, I was quite excited that. Uh, that, that Collins might win in round four, but he ended up winning by a technical knockout because uh, uh, Nigel Ben had injured his his ankle, so um, Nigel Ben couldn't continue because he had a he he messed his ankle up. So Collins was the the victor in in round four, but it was technical knockout. And I I'd written on my betting slip, so I get the betting slip out. I'm all excited. It says uh, Collins to KO uh, Nigel Ben. Um, so I wasn't sure whether I'd won. I was, I was expecting I'd probably had, but wasn't certain. So then I had a couple of days until I got down the betting shop on the Monday um, to find out whether I'd won. And then when I gave the betting sh- uh, slip to, to old Morrissey um, and he gave me £82 back from a £2 stay, oh, that, that was it for me. I just fell in love with, with betting and, um, you know, the stakes gradually increased from there, as you, as you, can, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, fantastic tales there. Um, what advice actually, you know, because you've had such a long um, career in hunting, what advice would you give to people who might just be starting out? What are the three things sort of you missed maybe when you were going and seeing Mr. Morrissey that if you could go back, you'd do differently? Um, I just think you need to absorb as much information as possible. I think my, my edge, I was quite good from a very early age. And I think that was because my life was just so devoted to sport. I mean, if you're prepared to invest the hours you know you get out what you put in it's the same with anything any walk of life in there and I think because I'd spent basically those full 18 years up to that point immersed in sport you know I used to um, question a sport come on and I get it all right you know I'm sounding quite cocky here aren't I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't no no no, no, no you're too modest <laughs> if anything I just think you just think <laughs> if you devote time to something you get results and um, if yeah advice to anyone getting in, involved in punting is don't do it unless you are confident you have some sort of edge or you, you can at least play on a level playing field you know I went into the book he's quite confident that I knew as much as the odds compilers um, um, and if you feel that you know more than the odds compilers obviously get heavily involved uh, but if you if you're not confident that you know know as much then just don't do it that would be my advice okay and you're known as the golf lover but um, what other sports do you enjoy uh, well, uh, growing up, football was the main one. Uh, I grew up in the 80s when um, the, the Liverpool sides of the 80s, which is m- majestic to watch. Mm. I know Liverpool are doing well now, but back then in the 80s, you know, they played a brand of football that was a uh, you know, different class. And then uh, cricket became uh, big on my radar when I moved to Australia. I lived in Australia for a year and had to fully engage in cricket because they were obsessed with it over there. Um, so they were my two main sports for initially. And then uh, <clears throat> then, then golf became came onto the radar big time um, in the late 90s um, when I watched uh, Nick Faldo defeat Greg Norman. That was a really, really, uh, in the Masters, uh, when, when Faldo fought back and beat, beat Norman in the Masters, I sort of fell in love with golf at that stage. And then uh, and then Tiger Woods became my hero. So, yeah, in those early years, I was, I was, I was betting on everything, really. I just, you know, perhaps a little bit overconfident. That's another little bit of tip you can give to your, to your listeners. Um, the youngsters tend to think that they can be masters of everything um, when the truth is if you narrow down your focus to uh, to one or two sports um, you know I, I only bet on golf and darts now um, and I, I may need to, to to get rid of darts to just have uh, full focus on golf yeah if you can narrow down your focus then you have much more success um, <clears throat> so that's um, yeah that, that would be my advice for your uh, your followers William um well, well so you thought more for us to be of, of that, I'm sure. Um, speaking about focusing on just one sport, do you ever feel that there was a time in your life when you might have bet on too many sports at the same time? You might have tried to do too much? Absolutely, and absolutely, no question. I mean, um, from a very, very, very early age, as soon as I started punting, I, I, I had that initial success I was telling you about on boxing. I wouldn't go near boxing now. I don't know anything about it. I just... Um, yeah, I got I got too involved in, in, in too many things, particularly our four-legged friends. I mean... Um, yeah, well documented. I had a weakness at one point for greyhound racing, which is, um, you know, I, I do love the sport of greyhound racing. If you treat greyhound racing as a little bit of fun, um, you know, it's obviously a great night out for all the family, chicken in a basket, you name it. Um, but if you start betting uh, on too many dog races, then you can get in a little bit of trouble. And, um, yeah, I remember in my university years, um, 
uh, when I went to Bournemouth University, I found a couple of kindred spirits who were very into punting, uh, Richard de Mellim and uh, Luke Tredgett. If you're think, if you thinking I'm an aggressive punter, you should meet Luke Tredgett. He's a very aggressive punter. He went on to be a golf compiler at uh, Betfred and um, I think worth a sporting index as well. Um, but, we, yeah, we were like the three amigos. We used to... Um, spend our university time in the betting shop there was a corals in in winton high street we spent more time there than we did at the the, the, the campus uh we really all three of us hated the uh, the university sort of culture um we just did just enough we attended just enough lectures to um to stay in in the game sort of thing but um but graham racing in those days when was when i was at university um you know we used to we used to spend like all friday in the betting shop and um you know you, there was a, uh, a a bet you could have in there in those days of um, who, which track would have the most winning favourites. So you had more more up against Swindon on Friday afternoons, and more more seemed to beat Swindon every week, you know. But the the the, the prices hardly ever changed. It was like eleven to ten Swindon. Swindon was the outsider. Then you had um, more more at ten to eleven. It never got shorter than eight to thirteen. So every week, you know, we built our week up to Friday. Just save all you could for Friday. Pile into more more to have most winning favourites uh, over Swindon. And that would give you an interest in every every dog race. So, yeah, we sort of all scraped through university and got our got our degrees, but uh, spent most of it you know, learning from other punters in the betting shop. Um, again, probably not advisable for your followers, but um, if you spend all time in the betting shop, then you you, you learn a few things from from characters, um, and um, yeah, it increases your betting education. But I um, yeah, I, I I don't regret any of that to be honest, William. But um, you know, it was good fun. And uh, I would have regretted it if I didn't get my degree because you need to get a degree to get some, um, you know, access to, to, to jobs and whatnot. And probably wouldn't have got my job at the Racing Post had I not. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you, you sort of get older and wiser and uh, you realise, you know, I don't bet on grounds anymore. I've um, had a brown bet for, for years. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, as I say, I'm just trying to focus on the golf. That's a very good place upon which to end part one. And in part two, actually, we will be talking lots more about golf hunting and the ins and outs of it. Stay tuned for then. Thanks very much, Steve Palmer.